Andrew, I'm uh, really happy to meet you at least uh, virtually, if not in person. Uh, certainly know of you and uh, this incredible Towards an Atlas of Salish Sea Biodiversity uh, publication that you have been the backbone behind. Uh, the Salish Sea is teeming with life from a deep sea glass sponge reefs to rocky shorelines, tight tidal salt marshes, kelp forests, and eelgrass beds. In this presentation, uh, we'll share what we've learned about the marine animal diversity of Galliano Island, BC, and how we came to know about it with help from dozens of marine naturalists and research scientists. And two of our surprise guests include Andy Lamb, who uh -huh. is one of the authors of the, excuse me, uh, Marine Life at the Pacific Northwest, and Donna Gibbs, uh, both of whom hailed from the Vancouver Aquarium some time ago, but uh, Donna and Charlie have been uh, major, um, have compiled an immense database of decades of uh, taxonomy and photographs of areas that they have been diving. So I'm going to leave it at that other than to say, sorry, Andrew is a naturalist and an ecologist who lives in the traditional territories of the Humquamanum speaking peoples on Galliano. Andrew holds an MSc in environmental studies from the University of Victoria and serves as the curator of the Biodiversity Galliano Island Project and a director of the Institute for Multidisciplinary Ecological Research in the Salish Sea. So we look forward to hearing all about this atlas of the Salish Sea. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much, Deborah, Transition Salt Spring, all the organizers for welcoming us to present this evening. Um, I'm honored and deeply humbled to have the opportunity to present alongside our special guests this evening, Andy Lamb and Donna Gibbs of the Pacific Marine Life Surveys, who I'll shortly introduce to you. Um, I myself am primarily a terrestrial ecologist, so I do feel a bit often like a fish out of water. I just notice I have a little piece of moss on my desk in front of me. So this is really what I spend a lot of time focusing on is terrestrial biodiversity. And so one of my goals this evening is to speak as little as possible so that I can give Andy and Donna the limelight that they deserve. Oh. So in opening this presentation, I'm going to provide a brief summary of a project that we've been working on together. And then I'm gonna pass it off to them to take us on a dive into the biodiversity of the Salish Sea, featuring a variety of species that we've documented together around Galliano Island. And I'll begin um, with a territorial acknowledgement, situating our work within this beautiful bioregion. So we're connecting from Galliano and Thetis Islands. And here we'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of Penalicut, Pulitzum, Swasin and other Halkomitnam speaking peoples, as well as the nearby traditional territories of Sinchothan and Kalami Chosen speaking peoples. For the last seven years, um, through Immerse, this organization we founded, we've been working with a diversity of people who are deeply invested in the Salish Sea and its biodiversity, um, people who've dedicated their lives to its study, as well as people whose lives have depended upon it since time immemorial. One of the goals for our research is to develop information tools that can help to foster a more diverse and inclusive community of practice in biodiversity research here in the region. And when I imagine this vibrant community of practice, I think of all of these people and many others who have dedicated their lives to sharing their knowledge of the biodiverse places they live in. So this growing community of practice forms the backdrop of our presentation. Throughout the Salish Sea, there are numerous active biodiversity projects which are curated by local knowledge holders who are really in the ideal position to understand and steward their local biodiversity. <clears throat> and over the last decade, there's been a surge in the availability of biodiversity data, yet the literature suggests we have not yet begun to realize the potential for community biodiversity projects to contribute to the global biodiversity research community. It's automatically advancing my slides. Uh, so what we're working toward is the creation of a framework for biodiversity research that honors the roles of experts in the scientific community, as well as the central role of the naturalists and knowledge holders who live in the places we care about. One exemplary biodiversity, oh, sorry, it's, I, it's just automatically advancing my slides, I'm going to stop that. It's very annoying. Uh, 
<clears throat> so let me see. Ah, so where are we? One exemplary biodiversity project in the region is the Pacific Marine Life Surveys, uh, which we'll learn about momentarily. And this uh, quote here by Donna Gibbs, I think it says a lot. Um, it says a lot first about that people, about intrinsic motivation. People really care about biodiversity and they'll dedicate their lives to a study, whether or not that may be considered a professional occupation. Um, also naturalists and knowledge holders are generally undervalued in our society. There's a 2015 study that indicates that the efforts of citizen scientists represent around 2.5 billion in kind annually, exceeding most federally funded studies in spatial and temporal extent. The, the, the results of our research offer convergent evidence to strengthen these findings. Um, by strengthening the ties between scientists and community-based naturalists like Andy and Donna, we can mobilize significant amounts of biodiversity data at a time of critical need. Case in point, our recent paper, which was published in the Biodiversity Data Journal, which was authored by numerous experts and community scientists throughout the region, some of whom are here this evening with us. In this paper, we quantified the outcomes of the last century and a half of marine biodiversity research around Galliano Island. The data that we synthesized came from a diversity of sources, including primary literature, historical collections and museums, as well as contemporary citizen science observations. All told, we synthesized over 20,000 species occurrence records representing over 650 marine animal species. We then quantified the proportional contributions of each data source to our cumulative knowledge of the island's marine animal diversity. And what we found was that 60% of our knowledge is attributable to the Pacific Marine Life Surveys. These are the longstanding marine surveys that have been ongoing since the 1970s through the efforts of Andy Lamb, Donna and Charlie Gibbs, as well as several others in their extended network. Uh, so this result that we found, while well, quite simple, it really establishes a strong case for the importance of this kind of work, underlining the potential for local community scientists to contribute to the global biodiversity research community. Each source of data included in this data set had certain limitations, but when synthesized, contributed to a more comprehensive picture of our local biodiversity. <clears throat> the Pacific Marine Life Surveys established a critical baseline of Salish Sea biodiversity, amounting to over 248,000 observations from over 4,800 4, dives, documenting um, over 1,000 species from throughout the region. These surveys also set an outstanding example for community science. Andy and Donna have, been long, have long been working in collaboration with research scientists contributing to numerous published studies while also drawing on these studies to deepen their own research practices. Their work thus demonstrates what's possible when researchers and community scientists work together in reciprocal ways that go much deeper than our conventional understanding of citizen science. Given the extent of the Pacific Marine Life Surveys and other regional community uh, science initiatives, we believe that there's great potential to scale up the results of our study to engage communities in the mobilization of biodiversity data throughout the Salish Sea. Building on the results of our research, we're actively developing information systems that are geared to support biodiversity projects and other initiatives like the Pacific Marine Life Surveys to help increase capacity for community-based biodiversity research in the region. Now, we're not gonna go into detail about these tools and so forth that we're developing because we wanna, I think, um, reserve time to explore biodiversity with Andy and Donna instead, but I'm welcome anyone to follow up with me uh, later on if you're curious. So while we have an ambitious vision to work with communities throughout the bioregion, our presentation this evening uh, focuses on Galliano Island. As we've learned through these seminars, the Salish Sea is a complex and dynamic estuary and ecosystem, and Galliano Island is centrally situated right in the middle of the system. Um, it's bounded by, to the north and south by two powerful tidal channels, that's uh, poorly an active pass, and sits at a confluence between tidal influx from the Pacific Ocean and freshwater runoff from the Fraser River, which combine to create this really highly productive marine environment rich with biodiversity. Uh, so on that note, without further ado, uh, let's dive into that biodiversity. I'm going to pass this over to Andy and Donna. Uh, who will introduce us to a variety of the species documented in our recent paper. Um, of course, Andy and Donna, I would say they need no introduction, but they've already been introduced. 
Many of you will be familiar with their works through their popular field guide, the Marine Life at the Pacific Northwest. And I also just had the opportunity to speak very briefly to the importance of their work in the context of the Pacific Marine Life Surveys. Um, so yeah, Andy and Donna, it's off to you. If you want to unpause and meet yourselves. Well, thank you, uh, Andrew, for that. And I think we can, uh, I'll let you carry the ball on the acknowledgement of the First Nations, so I won't uh, belabor that. I, what I will want to say, though, is that uh, I'd like to speak to the third member a little bit of our group here, and that's Charlie Moffat, or sorry, Charlie Gibbs. And uh, Charlie's been, uh, was, was really significant in this uh, whole exercise because of his amazing skills as a computer programmer. And he likes to refer to himself as Chiphead Charlie. And I think uh, that probably says a lot. And uh, of course, Donna is, is obviously, well, maybe it's not obvious, but they are husband and wife. So they live in the same establishment and they've put in the majority of time on creating the database. They rescued a fossil diver like me who stuff down on paper and uh, allowed us to get started. So uh, without further ado, let's move to the first slide there. Just gonna note, um, there's a lot of interference when you both have your microphones on at the same time, so you probably want to. Oh, okay. I'll delete that if you can. Donna can shout from the corner. Mine's off, mine's okay. off. Okay. <laughs> okay, so where are we? Okay, we just need the slide for the sponge. I love it. You got it. I hope you can. Uh, you got it. Okay, we're going to go through a series of slides, and the first one for each group is going to show you some uh, of the actual data that uh, Andrew has spent a lot of time putting together, and uh, I won't belabor that. And you'll also see at the bottom the names of the creatures, both scientific and common, and I'd really like to appreciate the fact that the different photographers have contributed, many of them who live in the Salish Sea. So um, with that uh, ado, I guess we can go to the next slide. Are you seeing the slides? So, yeah. Okay. So um, this one is obvious. For those of you who are interested in scientific names, this one's called Polymastia Pachymastia. And it is a series of a couple of names there and we have what it essentially means a translation is many firm breasts okay. oh, next slide um i'm sorry i did i advanced it i'm not sure why you're not seeing it andy oh i'm just i'm still seeing the there we go okay um these uh animals are found now we got a twofer here we have a uh, 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 scallop, which is underneath, and you can see it's a, a pink scallop of, uh, that's underneath there, but it's covered with a, a species of sponge that you can see. So you're getting two different creatures on one slide here. And the interesting thing about this animal, it's often called a swimming scallop, and it swims around by clapping. It's, it looks like dentures, and it actually swims. So when divers approach it, or predators, it'll swim off the bottom. So it's about three inches, or sorry, about two inches across. Next slide. <clears throat> this is delayed reaction, but I'm getting it too. Okay, so we're into the next group, Nidarians, and you can see how important they are here. And uh, I'd have to say too that, of course, all these numbers that you're seeing on the left there are um, are uh, current numbers, and they they in theory could change as we move along. Um, this is one of the few dangerous marine creatures we have in our waters, the lion's mane. It has uh, very strong nidoblast cells in the tentacles, and it can do serious damage. It can certainly. Uh, pre uh, provide a very uh, strong stinging sensation and cause rashes on your skin. So you're best to avoid this species, even if it's washed up on the beach. Don't touch one. Okay, on we go. Next slide. 
So it's, it's and here we have uh, a predator prey uh, action scene here where we have uh, the fried egg jelly that's uh, being swept up in a batch of uh, uh, giant plumose anemones. So it's uh, being fed upon by one of its cousins. Both of these animals are cnidarians. And this is a frequent happening near the end of the summer when the, the jellies are drifting by. They don't swim very strongly, so any current will carry them into whatever might be in their path. And so uh, this one is being consumed. Next slide, please. What am I doing with that? Okay, another Nidarian. This is uh, a, a very tiny, what you're seeing there, these creatures are maybe an inch tall. So it look, they look like little tiny polyps, which they are. And around the uh, top of each polyp, you'll see little bulbous things. And those are the reproductive structures. In some areas, you'll, it, they're so thick that they'll look like a dusting of snow and uh, very, uh, very easy to find and very easy to identify. A lot of hydroids are very difficult to identify and it takes experts such as Henry Chung at the uh, Royal British Columbia Museum to figure them out. But uh, this one is pretty easy, even for me. Next slide, please. Okay, another group, uh, smaller group, catenophores, or a lot of people call them uh, uh, comb, jelly. comb jellies. Thank you. Um, this one is probably the one you see most often, and it has two long uh, uh, ten tentacular structures. Comb jellies are considered somewhat similar to cnidarians, a long time offshoot, and uh, when you're looking down off a float or uh, from a boat, you can often see them and you'll see these little spheres that are have prismatic effects, the light running up and down the, the sides of them on those uh, rows of, of structures called teens, which give them their name. And uh, very, very beautiful light show. They're an underwater light show. Next slide, please. Okay, another smaller group, the ribbon worms. Um, they're uh, very elongated and um, they actually prey on other worms. Uh, Sheila Byers, who was talking to you earlier, we like to call her Dr. Worm and she's into polychaetes, but uh, ribbon worms, or uh, they actually feed on, often feed on polychaetes and they have a, a structure in their mouth that's like a harpoon and the Harpoon fires out into the side of the of the worm or whatever prey, and then reels it in, and they they eat it. So they're pretty savage predators. Next slide, please. Uh, another smaller group, the flatworms. Um, they are um, very small. They're often fairly insignificant, I guess. You have to look closely to find them. But any of you are walking along a beach, particularly at this time of year with the low tides, if you flip over a rock and look underneath, you'll often see these little inch long, very flat worms sort of gliding along the underside of the rock and you often get a, quite a few of them. So, But make sure you flip your rock back so that everything's fine. Um, so this is an arrow worm and um, they are very tiny. They're almost like a sliver of glass when you see them drifting in the plankton. And they're easy to distinguish from a sliver of glass because when they move, they'll bend right in the middle like they're, they're folding themselves in half. Now, as a, as a naturalist, I never see a view like this that Elaine is focused on. And I'm kind of glad I'm not meeting that in my sleep anytime soon. Next slide, please. Okay, the mollusks, they're the biggest group we have and the most, the most different varieties that we have, I think in, the, in the, uh, the, the, the paper. And so there'll be quite a few slides on the various uh, uh, ones. So here we have a Dorid nudibranch, another twofer. This actually, this species was actually just separated uh, 
often this happens, but there was one species and it was decided there were two. And uh, so this one was hived off recently. And this is most of the dorids that are designed like this feed on sponges. And this one is actually crawling up and devouring a uh, orange finger sponge. This is a totally different design, uh, nudibranch. Uh, this is an aeolid and they have all these little sticky out bits all over their bodies. They're called serrate. Those animals are maybe an inch long and they're kind of crawling up looking for a nibble and the top end of that stem that you see is actually the crown of a hydroid that it's the feeding on, they're feeding on. And they might even make love and make more soon. Another uh, twofer we have here, we have a pink tritonia that is cruising along the mud flats. That's where they live. Uh, and we see them quite often. Actually, we had a bloom of them here last year on Thetis. And it is in the process of devouring a white sea pen. And it will consume that. And uh, that's what happens in nature. Next slide. Okay, this is a really old photograph of, I believe it's me. It may not be me, but I think it's me. That's an old piece of dive gear. That blue clunky thing on the arm is a, an edge, one of the earlier computers. But this is a giant Pacific octopus. And if you talk to any diver, the first thing they want to talk about is what they've seen is a giant Pacific octopus. And sometimes they'll come out and play. Most of the times they hide in caves. Next slide. Another member of the, the cephalopod group, this is a stubby squid. And this is a female who is just, I believe she's in the process of le uh, laying these egg cases. They look like little popper beads and uh, are almost pearl size uh, structures on the underside of a rock. Um, Bruce was really, I'm terrifically happy to have this photograph. We've captured her in mid stripe. The other thing on the left there is a vermilion star, one of the many different sea stars in the Salish Sea. Next slide. Another mollusk, this is one with a, this is a univalve, meaning it has one shell. This is a moon snail. This is a, a Lucian moon snail. Most of you are familiar with the big uh, Lewis's moon snail that you find at on the low tide cruising around and you find their funny looking egg, egg cases that are like plungers, big gray things. This is just a miniature version and usually this one is subtitled so you may or may not see that. Probably two inches across. Next slide. Here we have a giant chitin, used to be often referred to as a gumboot chitin, the largest chitin in the world. Cryptochitin means hidden chitin, and that refers to the fact that the eight shells are hidden underneath the skin. This one is caught in the act. It actually happens to be a male trying to produce more giant chitins. Next slide. How are we doing? <clears throat> So this is, a lot of you are not divers, and I'm trying to include a little bit here. This is in a low tide or an intertidal shot of a bunch of mudflat snails shot right here on Thetis Island. And in some places they are so thick, you can see the trails that they're wandering around. So thick, it's hard to believe that it's actually an invasive, that they're just so plentiful. And I'm sure they're on any beach on any of the islands that you go to. Next slide, please. I couldn't resist putting this in for another intertidal one. One of my friends caught this. Uh, this is a, um, the siphons of a gaper clam, one of the two species. And it's, uh, he caught it in midstream squirting a, a squirts of, of water as, as uh, it retreats, pulls in its siphon. I'm sure almost any of you walked on a beach have seen that happen and maybe had it squirt all over you. Okay, this is... Uh, uh, um, Sheila's favorite group, the annelids. So we'll spend some time on these. Um, this is the slime feather duster worm. Uh, 
So here we have another twofer. This is a um, scale worm. I probably should have Sheila do this part. She'd do it better than I am. But here we have a twofer. We have the red worm uh, crawling on the uh, leather star here. I've always wondered if, if sea stars were ticklish. You'd think that's its armpit there. So you would think it would be kind of ticklish. Oh, this is a beautiful photograph that a good friend took of a, of a tiny pelagic worm. This thing swims around at lightning speed in the mid water and trying to get a photograph of one of these, let alone the one with such exquisite detail. This was a really coup uh, that he got there. They're just beautiful little animals. That's maybe an inch long and it's on the move all the time. Next slide. This is a really cool slide that my friend Jan got. Uh, he very seldom will you find this animal out in the open. In the middle, the biggest part of that shot shows what really you usually see. It's just the fan. But this one had emerged and it was lying on the bottom. So Jan got a chance to get the whole body of this worm into the photo. So fantastic shot. <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> Yeah. Cypunculids, and we don't have very many photos of these. Um, we've, we've cobbled together a few slides that we had. Uh, my friend, co-author Bernie uh, took this um, a number of years ago, but it's a small group. They're sometimes called cypunculid worms, but they're really not worms at all. Hence the name peanut worm. I don't, I don't know what more we can say about peanut worms. Okay, crustaceans. This is a, a larger group. This is particularly significant for beachcombers and divers because we all see lots of them in the various groups. And um, they're, they're mobile, they're mostly fairly large, so they're really available to most of us to see. This is an interesting photo showing a female um, red rock crab about uh, pretty much ready to deliver her thousands and thousands of eggs uh, into the wide, wide world. And that's what they do. They lower their abdomen flap when they let them go. This photograph is, was from one of the dive, we used to run a dive lodge and charter here with Peter Luckham. And we'd bring up stuff so that the, the people could see at the end of the dive. And we collected this tanner crab and it was right in the process of molting. We didn't even know it at the time, but over the whole day, we had it in this aquarium and it actually molted before our very eyes. And it just made a fantastic uh, demonstration. Next slide, please. All of these animals are in the Sailor Sea. We're not, we're not slipping anything in. Here's another really cool slide. Um, when you're looking at, you don't always see most of the hermit crab. It's usually you're just seeing the front end. Here you're seeing most of the body, but you're also seeing it's a female with a brood of eggs that you can see there on the right, and she'll be releasing them fairly soon. So very nice photo. There's about 25 or different hermit crabs in our area. Next slide, please. Did he not off? No. No, it's gone. Oh, there That's we go. Right. Okay, this is a very common shrimp. Uh, you would see it sometimes if you're just walking along and looking off a dock and in, along the pilings, you'll see them. It's sometimes called the dock shrimp, but we call it the coon striped shrimp. And if you look closely, there's actually a tiny one beside the big one. And what you have there is the tiny male trying to make friends with the bigger female. And most shrimps in our waters are first males and then become females. So this is, again, a really great shot by Tom, just to show that. OK. Next slide. Two shrimps there. Yeah, did you see that? Yeah. Let's take a look. 
Okay, this is a really cool slide. Pat sent me a number of years ago. It was actually a number of a series of them. Pat lives or was living on Galliano, I believe. Anyway, it's uh, she shot it just with a camera of some that she put in the water. She or snorkeling, so it's a it's a shrimp in the process of molting, casting off its exoskeleton and. Uh, hopefully quickly enough growing a new one before it gets gobbled up. It's sitting on a, a, a piece of uh, sargassum weed here. Another slide with a double, a twofer. We have a giant lingcod leering at you. But if you look on its lower jaw, you'll see what's labeled in the slide. And uh, this shrimp is also been determined not too long ago, actually, that it was a cleaner species, which means it will crawl inside the mouth and around the body of a large predator looking for little tiny um, parasites. And the lady who took this, Lena Holm, was a guest of ours and a good friend from Sweden. She came all the way from Sweden to take that photograph for us. Next slide, please. Okay, we're kind of looking at a nudibranch here, uh, um, and we talked about them already, and you're seeing a beautiful nudibranch, but if you look in the middle of the nudibranch there, you will actually see little white banana-like things drooping there. Those are actually eggs of a copepod that's actually laid its eggs so that they develop inside the nudibranch and then burst open, so kind of a gory way to do things, but it it obviously works very well for the copepod. The alien. <laughs> yeah, the alien. Bryozoans, um, a smaller group again, uh, but very, very interesting because a lot of them, particularly the harder encrusting ones, calcio calcified ones, really look like corals. And people look at that photo there and they think it's a coral, but it's, it's actually a bryozoan. And you can see some uh, blue top snails there. So you get another twofer here. You get a mollusk and you get a bryozoan. Next slide. How am I doing? 736. Nodding heads, uh, pretty little group as you see. We only have one photo. They're very similar to uh, um, bryozoans, the structure. Uh, it, where the anus is placed on the thing is critical, which uh, appeals to my humor, I guess. Next slide, please. And this is a uh, lampshell, and uh, they all, all of these animals, bryozoans, uh, brachiopods, and lamp, lampshells, and uh, nodding heads all have something called a lophophore, which is a very specific device. And if you look between the two shells, you'll see what you're seeing there is the lophophore or the feeding, breathing device of the lampshell. Next slide, please. Pheronids, again, are another one in the group that have the lophophores, and you're seeing the lophophores there. These, that slide is maybe two inches across, so there's a lot of little tiny guys there. It's a colony. And those white clusters in there, that's the reproductive parts of the, of the individuals that you're seeing. Next slide, please. Okay, we're on to the echinoderms. Uh, echinoderms. Again, another group that most of you should be familiar with. You see them intertidally, subtidally. They're available to most of us in many of the different habitats in the Salish Sea. And here we have a sunflower star being eaten by a gull. And uh, I'm sure you've seen gulls eat other sea stars. I hadn't seen one eating a sunflower star. Um, not much more to say on that. Next slide, please. Nice, so nice it shot. Looks like a drawing. Yeah, no, it's, it's good in there. Okay, we're going to look at feather stars or crinoids, as they were called. Crinoids, the, there's a lot of them in the world today, but in past ge ge geologic history, they were one of the dominant forms. They were huge, many of them on great big stalks. Uh, but there's not as many. We don't, we only have really one species in our area and this is it. You're looking at, these are attached to the Boeing 737 artificial reef that uh, we dive off of uh, California or we dive off of Shimanus here. So kind of a fun place to go. 
Next slide, please. Okay, and I think almost anybody who's participating at tonight, if they haven't, if they've been down in the beach and they haven't seen one of these, they're either blind, dead, a civil servant, or I forget what the other one was. Anyway, the common purple or ochre star, it's called ochraceous, but all the ones in the Salish Sea are virtually all of them are purple. So um, you have to go to the outer coast to see the ochre colored ones but very, very, they're iconic to our, to the sailor sea. What more can I say about purple seas or ochre stars? Next slide, please. Okay, another species of, of and group are the sand dollars. They're related to the, they're kind of flattened, uh, uh, sea urchins with very, very fine spines. And you're looking at a beach scene. We were here, we actually went diving at this site today and we saw this very situation. So the black ones are actually alive and the other whitish ones are just the skeletons or the tests, they're called tests of the um, uh, sand dollars. And uh, they're, they're you never just find one or two. You'll either find a whole pile of them and you won't find any. So something to look for on the beach when you're out beach combing. Next slide, please. Okay, well, we got a twofer here. There's the, a green sea urchin that is uh, in the urchin group, very, very common. And uh, it's kind of taking over in some areas as we speak. Uh, because of the lack of some predators, including uh, sea otters, and more importantly here, the, the, um, the sunflower stars that have been felled by a disease. We'll get into that. And on the main focus there is a white colored uh, giant sea cucumber. Once in a while, you'll find a white one like that. Mostly they're, they're sort of a, a brownish color. They look, they look like they have really hard spiny bits, but they don't really. Next slide, please. Ah, okay. <laughs> this is what I was referring to. In 2013, we had an outbreak of uh, sea star wasting disease, and it had a devastating effect, effect on many species of um, sea stars. This was a pink star, believe it or not, and that's all that's left of it. It was completely dissolved. And uh, it's, it's, it's that research is going on is to determine what it is. Uh, it was uh, a virus is probably involved, but now there's some thought that it's also an environmental problem where they're kind of getting suffocated, but we're still working on that. Okay, onto the sea squirts uh, or tunicates as they're more ascidians as they're more uh, correctly called. And there's two main groups uh, that we'll touch on here. I think time's running, so we'll move along. Next slide. Okay, we're, uh, so what you're looking at, you see a bunch of little holes around a center. It looks like a flower with a bunch of little holes around it. What you're seeing are colonies of, uh, of compound or colonial tea, sea squirts. And each of those little holes is an incurrent siphon. And in the middle of that little circle is the common excurrent siphon. So it's kind of like the septics, septic field for each of the individuals around. And that's, that photograph's probably about four inches across. So uh, many, many condos. So this is the um, solitary version, which that last slide was based on. And uh, that's a uh, incurrent and excurrent mm -hmm. section. One of the largest, most easily found. Next slide, please. Ah, my favorite fish are kind of my thing, and I'm an I'm a sebastophile, so uh, that's that's my baby in the front of there. You notice it's called a yellow eye rockfish, but 
the eye isn't yellow. That's, that's because it's a juvenile and it doesn't get a yellow eye until it gets bigger. So uh, lots of fish in the Salish Sea. And uh, unfortunately over the years in many areas, a lot of them have been overutilized, shall I say. I just love this photograph by Carol Wall sent this to me years ago. A bunch of um, a group of uh, pinpoint gunnels and uh, a, a crab there kind of, I don't know who muscled into whose territory, but th these are very elongate eel shaped fishes and some of the gunnels are difficult to identify, but because this one has the black line stripe going through its eye, it's very easy to identify. Um, and you see this even intertidally, you can sometimes see them slithering around in the, in the eel grass. Next slide, please. One of our favorite, if you don't like a spiny lump sucker, you just better go home. They're, they're the cutest little fish. That, that individual there was maybe an inch long. I've heard them called um, uh, uh, ping pong balls with fins. I've heard them called little blimps with pokey out things. They just huff and they puff all around, but they have a little suction cup on their belly that's a modification of two sets of fins on the underside. And they actually will attach to things. And it's, it's amazing to, you think that would be so obvious, but it's really hard to find. And most divers get really excited when they find one of these. Next slide, please. Okay, we got a video here that uh, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Chu um, put together for us who was in, the, in on the paper of a sponge bioherm. And we're looking at uh, glass sponges, the big uh, 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 glass sponges. And what's drifting into the frame is a large six gill shark. One of the, one of our, as a diver, it was probably a highlight, one of my highlights to see one of these beasts. Uh, in so many places in the world, you have to go deep, deep in submersibles. But in Washington and British Columbia, the Salish Sea, they actually come up into relatively shallow water. And they're a very primitive shark. And you can see I'm talking more about the shark than the sponges here, but that just shows my, uh, my perception. There's the sponge, the sponge reef you're looking at there. Okay, on to the mammals and most People, I don't need to talk much about killer whales. You've probably talked about killer whales quite a bit. Everybody knows about killer whales, I think. So I'll, I'll uh, leave that go by. But this is, as a diver, this is something we encounter uh, or you can encounter depending on where you go. I prefer not to be in such a, a madhouse. I like them to come by one at a time and drift around and say hi and do pirouettes and move on. I, I don't like being mobbed like this. This was probably fairly near to a rookery or a haul out. Um, they get quite aggressive. I haven't heard of anybody seriously hurt yet, but it's just a little unnerving. And you can see one of them's looking at a giant red urchin on the bottom there, another one on the end of the side. One of them's picked up a sea star, I think there. Yeah, I think it's the sunflower star, one of them's grabbed onto, but they're, uh, they're just magnificent. They make a diver feel like a clumsy oaf. They just pirouette around and you feel so, I don't know, what's the word? So useless. Yeah. Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Awkward, yeah. Anyway, I think that's the end. And I think we're within our time yeah, limit here. I don't know where Andrew wants to take this, but I guess. As uh, what it, you used to say, bidia, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andy. We had a bit of a delay, uh, so I was doing my best to advance the slides in sync with well, what I anticipated. Your, your yeah. Next. Okay. Sorry. It, anyway, hopefully it worked. That was wonderful. We have a few questions. Okay. Um, Fire I'll away. Start with Doug. Doug, did you get your question answered with? Donna answered in the chat. Just to, uh, come, we can come back to that if you want more information on the depth for sea creature populations. And Donna said, yes, there are different depths. And for sports diving, most of what you're seeing is between the surface and 130 feet. Um, and Erin Ann, you wanted to know um, 
it was about those little shell creatures. <laughs> yeah, and, and Aaron Ann was wanting to know, did you say that they were, it's hard to believe that they're not invasive? Sorry, that they are invasive. Okay. They, they are one of the invasives, but they outnumber, certainly in some of our beaches here on Thetis Island, they just outnumber everything else by a large, large margin. But they've been around a long time and they obviously like it here. How are we to interpret the numbers? For example, Galliano 1, BC 7. I think I can come yeah. yeah, sorry, that should have been clear. I'll, I'll go back to some slides. This is just a summary of the diversity um, for the paper that we put together. We made our best effort to uh, summarize diversity for different regions, different regional scales, whether it was the Northeast Pacific um, or yeah, the Pacific North America, British Columbia or the Salish Sea, but that's our best estimate of the diversity. And then Galliano Island is, of course, the following summary is the diversity documented around the island. So that's clear now. Uh, we have a question from Doug here. Oh, sorry. Um, I What's learned that? ocean is acidifying a bit in the past 50 years. Are we approaching a tipping point for sea creatures in the near term? That'll be a tricky one. Does anyone take that on? Uh, I can't. Oh, this is oh, Don here. here. I, I can't. I can't, I can't really answer, 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 answer that. Answer that. Yeah, that's 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 that. that. Uh, I'm. I don't study ocean acidification. But I think you. I think you all would probably uh, consider the what the sea butterflies which I, uh, we didn't see, but are tiny types of mollusks uh, that they, I think are, uh, there's some concern about ocean acidification on them, is that? Well, there's, there's ocean acidification concern about anything with a shell. There you go. I mean, the shells are getting thinner and weaker, so it's a problem. I don't know what this is. <clears throat> that helped. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so so uh, I think, sorry, if I can just speak to that a little bit in the sense that uh, we are still so early on, in spite of the fact that it's probably about 15 years in this whole concept of ocean acidification, it's still quite difficult for the, the research scientists to really have any definitive um, answers yet. Uh, warming waters, warming temperatures are, are certainly one of the factors, but they're not the, they're not the only factor. Uh, obviously, too much carbon carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is pushing us towards this difficult uh, scenario. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess I would leave it there and just say, stay tuned. Okay, next. Someone asked about um, sea star wasting disease, and Andy did talk about that a little bit. Is there any thing people would like to add about that? Uh, Evie, Evie asked about that. Well, I guess I can talk a little bit about it. It's, it's on, the research is ongoing. There's people all up and down the coast from California to Alaska contributing and a lot of citizen scientists, some of the photographers, John Kosian, uh, others divers, but people can get involved. We're gonna have our second annual Sea Start count with our elementary school group in a couple of weeks here where we're going to go to a beach and lay out a, a set of lines and assign kids and to go and count sea stars and it it's it's something you can go and count purple sea stars or ochre sea stars it's it's really easy to contribute and uh, people can feel like they're they're doing something so it's it's an ongoing story and uh, it, it's uh, it's not nowhere near we don't really know the final answer to it and it's interesting because sea stars different ones are affected in different ways and different species are affected or not affected some some hardly at all and some in some areas are infected where they're not in other areas we were diving today and when we used to go diving a lot over the years uh, seeing sunflower stars were it was like they were everywhere. It was like, oh, well, that's boring. And, and you never paid that much attention. We went out today 
for an hour's dive and we saw two and you thought we'd found a gold mine. So it's there, there hopefully there's signs that things are improving, but uh, it's, it's very spotty. There's so much, seems to be so much going on and it may be interrelated to some other things. It seems that the sea cucumbers now, there's a species of sea cucumber in some areas that seems to be having some, look like some sort of a disease issue and whether it's the same thing or something different, uh, we don't know, but it just speaks to the fact there's so few of us out there diving and looking uh, that a lot of this stuff goes unknown. I mean, there might've been a sea star wasting event back in the 1850s or something, but nobody would have known. It might be a cyclical event. It, it, you know, there's as many guesses you could have as, as any, and it's, it's going to be a long process, and I'm rambling on, but hopefully that covers some of it. Thanks, Andy. That's great. Yes, and, and uh, BC compared to California is one of those extremes of locations that you're, you're describing there. But California has definitely been hit super hard, and uh, they're not seeing much of anything at this point. But I do want to ask Andrew, um, uh, I mean, this is a huge amount of work. Uh, being a citizen scientist myself, I, I am tremendously thankful for all the effort that you put into this, along with all of your, your uh, uh, the people involved, to pull this all together. Um, I am surprised that you are not marine oriented, but rather terrestrial. So do you mind if I ask you what your specific uh, master's was focused on? Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess what, I guess to uh, preface this all, um, before I even began my master's, I, I, I initiated a project on Galliano to um, basically document all the species diversity around us, the Biodiversity Galliano Project. And I remember hesitating early on in that, wondering, well, geez, I, who am I to undertake such, a, such, a, such an initiative? I don't have a PhD in this area or that. But then I kind of I thought further about that. And well, any community waited along for, waited for you know, multiple PhDs to come along to start cataloging biodiversity and all these domains that just probably wouldn't happen. So um, that's the backdrop really for the work that I do is this community biodiversity project. And um, I later did uh, begin a master's at, at UVic and I did my work in pollinator ecology, actually. Um, my first paper was published um, looking at vascular plant diversity, vascular plant com communities and their um, adaptation in response to a seasonal drought in the Southern Gulf Islands. Oh my goodness, that that's pretty relevant right now with uh, whether, you know, the temperature is warming as we go north. Uh, so are we to expect a part two on terrestrial plants of Galliano? Yeah, so this, this is a funny thing. It began with this ambitious initiative to establish a baseline, formalize the outcomes of the biodiversity project. There's now over 4,000 species reported, mm -hmm. including everything from diatoms to, to whales to all, all manner of terrestrial biota. And um, the first paper ended up being the, the marine biodiversity or the marine animal diversity, primarily because of the motivation and initiative of Andy and Donna, how on top of it all they were, how, how um, motivated, yeah. Um, so I, we ended up breaking it down into a series of papers. So the first one was marine animal diversity and the next one will be marine botany. Ah, um, okay. And we have a lot, we have a lot on marine diatoms thanks to a community scientist on the island who's been working for now over a decade uh, cataloging diatom diversity. Oh my gosh. So we that's have to go for a break Fantastic. everybody. Yes, sorry, if, I'm if just going to, I just want to say thank you to all of you, uh, Andrew, Andy and Donna, uh, fabulous talk, fabulous pictures. And uh, then Deb's gonna go to break from here. So thank you very much.